Let me start by saying thank you very warmly from my heart to uh, Father Lawrence. And also, deep thanks to um, the, uh, the whole uh, group involved here, the Center for Faith and Culture, and then the World Community of Christian Meditators. Uh, I've been reading John Maine for many, many years, actually, and uh, always with great appreciation. When you read John Maine, it often seems like it's fairly simple and straightforward. But I've discovered that there are unusual depths to, uh, to John Maine's thought and to his teaching. And so I'm happy to repay back to a group like this something of the things that I've learned from reading John Maine over the course of, uh, of, of these years. And very much, of course, in the light of, as Father Lawrence was saying, in the light of the great tradition. Because my life's work has really, uh, as a theologian and historian, has been dedicated to trying to recapture the riches of the tradition for the contemporary world. Um, G.K. Chesterton once called uh, tradition the democracy of the dead. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that we, they get a vote <laughs> as much as we get a vote. And we can learn from them and get from them. They're not past and gone. They are still alive. They're still having that effect on contemporary society and on those who are dedicated to what they speak of in terms of uh, spirituality, mysticism, about which I'll be talking tonight, and of course the notion of meditation, which is central uh, to both of those. So what I'm going to be doing tonight is, uh, is a talk that I've given in numerous places in various ways, because it's not a talk that's written out. Uh, it's a talk that represents certain headings and certain points that I think are important for understanding the nature of mysticism. And I often get asked, you know, well, come and tell us what mysticism is. I'm not sure that anybody can tell you what mysticism is, but I can talk about what it has meant and what effect I think it should have in the, uh, in the contemporary world. And so my, my talk is an invitation to a discussion. It's an invitation to a dialogue. It's also an invitation to the practical character of mysticism as the practice of prayer, contemplation, and, and meditation. So I'm going to start by just a few remarks on why is mysticism important, and indeed why is mysticism necessary. And then I'll say more about uh, the development of the whole idea of Christian uh, mysticism and the way in which I understand it, a kind of heuristic or building, uh, gradually deepening notion of what that might be. I'm going to start with two quotations. Henri Bremond, great scholar of uh, French mysticism in the early part of the 20th century, wrote an 11 volume history of religious, uh, literary history of religious thought in France. And in one place, I think it's at the end of the second volume, he has the quotation, I'll, I'll just, it's very brief, he says, it is not possible to ignore the mystics without disowning the self. It's not possible to disown the mystics without, uh, to, uh, you know, to ignore the mystics without disowning the self. That there's something, even if one does not consider oneself a mystic, there's something crucial to the message of the great mystics about what it means to be human, what it means to be a, a human person. <coughs> Raymond didn't think of himself as a mystic. He thought of himself as a scholar. But he devoted his life to studying the history, particularly of French mysticism. Second quotation. Karl Rahner, one of the great theologians of the 20th century. Rahner once said, the Christian of the future will either be a mystic, that is, will have experienced something, or will not be a Christian at all. Many of you have heard that quotation, I'm sure. The Christian of the future will either be a mystic or will not be a Christian at all. And I think that what I'm going to try to explain a little bit is why I think that quotation from Rahner is, uh, is so true, because it may give us a little wider picture of what a mystic is. Bremond thought of the mystics as a pretty special group, but he still considered them as essential for understanding the nature of humanity. Now, mysticism is a word that's very easily misunderstood. For some people, it means something bizarre, something uncanny, weird, magical, strange. For others, mysticism is the realm of paranormal religious experiences, strange things, visions, 
stigmata, levitations, in adia or going without food for you know, years and years, severe asceticism, things that we don't have in our own lives or very few of us could have, and even things that we don't see around us very, very much. There are even people within the Christian communities who recognize, of course, that great saints can be described as mystics or contemplatives, but that mysticism is an elite phenomenon. It's something that's meant only for the privileged few. It's not something that has anything to do with normal, everyday Christian life. But what I'm going to try to do, following the lead of Rahner and various others, is to uh, emphasize that mysticism, or perhaps better, the mystical element in religion, as I like to call it, or if you will, the contemplative dimension, is integral and necessary to all Christian life. Indeed, I think it's part of the vocation that Christians are called to from their baptism on. Because if we take mysticism in the very generic sense of a recognition of God's transforming presence in our lives and an attempt to find a deepening of that sense within our lives, then I think all Christians are mystics and are called to mysticism and called to a deeper consciousness of that mystical element. And that mystical element, I would emphasize, is interactive with the other aspects of our religious faith. I depend here a lot on a great a scholar of mysticism of the early part of the 20th century, a great English scholar, Baron Friedrich von Hügel, despite his name. He was, well, he was half Austrian and half uh, Scots. Uh, and he wrote in English that sounds more like German, but he wrote a very important book called The Mystical Element of Religion. And in his book, The Mystical Element of Religion, von Hügel identified three elements to what he called healthy religion. The institutional, the intellectual, and the mystical. That he typified through the three apostles, Peter representing the institutional, Paul representing the intellectual, and the apostle John representing the, the mystical, the spiritual element, if you will. And von Hügel's model here of religion, in a certain sense, can be said to be, looks very simple, but it's actually rather profound. And why it's profound is because von Hügel insisted that it was only the healthy interaction of all of those aspects of religion, institutional, intellectual, and mystical, that produced the, the sane, normal, well-balanced religious personality, and even the well-balanced and successful uh, religious, uh, religious group or, uh, or, if we will, denomination, etc. That if one or the other of these elements sought to suppress the others or forget about the others or disregard the others, that was where danger started. And so I think von Hugo had a very deep insight there that the mystical element is not religion in itself, but it's an element in religion. It's an aspect in religion that integrates with the institutional, that integrates with the intellectual, but that brings something to the whole, the integrated whole, that neither the institution as an institution nor the intellectual side of religion can do, even important though, though they may be. So we also need to emphasize, I think, at the beginning that the notion of mysticism, and I'll explain a little bit more about the meaning of the term, it's not just a matter of performing certain acts, doing certain kinds of things. It's a whole way of life. It's a change of mentality. Certainly that mystical element consists of prayer, it consists of certain forms of asceticism, it consists of meditation, it consists of contemplation, etc. cetera. Um, but it's the attitude from which those are performed that is the most important thing. The mystical or contemplative dimension changes the way that we do all of our religious acts and our outlook on the world. Many of you are familiar, of course, with Thomas Merton. If you read Thomas Merton's New Seeds of Contemplation, which I'm sure some of you have, Merton is very good on that, on what he called usually the contemplative dimension. He sometimes used the word mystical, but not all that often. But he shows how that is an integrative change of attitude rather than the performance of particular activities. Meister Eckhart, I like to call Meister Eckhart my friend Eckhart, says in one of his sermons, 
If you think you're finding more of God in church than you are in the stable or out in the workplace, you are buffling up God's head in a blanket and stuffing him under a bench. <laughs> you find God everywhere. It's not that you disregard the church and the prayer that you're supposed to be involved in the church, but your attitude should be, I can find God in the stable, and I can find God in my, in my workplace as well. Another misunderstanding that I want to clear up. Uh, mysticism is not individualistic and solipsistic. It's personal, but it's personal within the community and the community of, uh, of the church. And indeed, the mystical gifts that are given even to the greatest figures in the history of mysticism, think of a Teresa of Avila, for example, are not for her alone, they're for the community her religious community of Reformed Carmelite nuns and for the church uh, as, as a whole. And the only test for who may or may not be a true mystic is the gospel test. By their fruits you will know them. Anybody can claim a vision. Anyone can claim some kind of special experience. But in the history of the church, the only people who can be known as part of this tradition are the people whose fruits are known both in their own lives and also in the effect that they've had, that they've had on, uh, on others. So the mystical element, again to use that term from uh, von Hugel, is always ecclesiological. It happens to individual members within the church, within their, uh, within their ecclesial community, but it is for the church, and it is mediated by the church. It's only within the last century that we begin to find kind of unchurch mysticism, which you know, produces an interesting phenomenon that we can talk about. But the great traditions, not only the Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition, the Islamic tradition, etc., the mystics are integral parts of those traditions. Sometimes, of course, they're you know, questionable, there are arguments, there are debates, they have their opponents, etc., but they see themselves as within the tradition, the great uh, Jewish Kabbalists, for example, you know, they're rabbis in the community during the day and at night they do their Kabbalistic uh, speculations within their, uh, within their particular groups. So we can, I think, speak about the term everyday mysticism. Everyday mysticism. The term is used by Karl Rahner and it's used by a number of other people who've spoken about and written about mysticism in the course of the last century or so, that this is not an elite phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon only for the two, for the very, very few. It's a, not a phenomenon which is characterized primarily by some kinds of special, miraculous, paranormal experiences. These happen, but they're never the core. The mysticism is an everyday consciousness of God's deepening presence in our lives and the transformation that that's meant to affect in us. So, well, what about this word, this term, mysticism? Well, it's a modern word. You won't find that particular noun in the tradition before about the 17th century. When certain thinkers and religious uh, figures, uh, first of all in France, but in other places, begin to talk about mysticism, mysticism. And so some contemporary investigators said, well, maybe we shouldn't use that word, you know. I mean, it's not, a, it's not an ancient word. It, it's, not a, it, it's a new word. It speaks to a particular kind of phenomenon. It's certainly become a word within the academy of those who discuss religion and, and, and religious things. Uh, but it, is it, does it really fit within Christianity? My claim is that it does. While the word mysticism is a modern term and has many connotations, you know, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, the qualifier, the adjective mystical, mystikos in Greek, mystikos in Latin, these are very ancient terms in Christianity. They're not found in the Christian scriptures in the New Testament, but they come into Christian discourse quite early in the second century to indicate the hidden, the depth dimension of Christian life and practice. They mean secret, they mean hidden, originally from a Greek verb about closing the mouth. And Christians in the second century, Clement of Alexandria is one major figure here, 
began to use them to indicate the depth dimension, as I call it, of Christian practice. Let me give an example. The scriptures. The first and most common way in which mysticus is used is of the deep spiritual understanding of the scripture, the mystical sense of the scripture. Why? Because anybody can read the scriptures. In the second century, a pagan, and many pagans did pick up the Christian scriptures, and they read them, and they said, oh, this is nonsense, this is garbage. You know, and we have many pagans who attacked Christianity who had read the scriptures and who used things in the scriptures, sometimes the, you know, the disagreements between various parts of the Gospels and other things to say, well, Christianity is a false religion. Because they were reading the surface. They weren't reading the depths. And so these Christian thinkers, theologians, and mystical spiritual authors said, you have to read the deep meaning. You have to read the mystical sense of the text. And the mystical sense of the text will show you the coherence of all of the scriptures and what they were written for. To read on the surface is to misread. In the same way, they began to talk about the Christian sacraments as mystical. Why? Because look at the Christian sacraments. Christians get together and share bread and wine. Or, you know, they initiate someone into the community by pouring some water over, over their head. What does that mean? Well, it means nothing if you don't see the deep, if you don't have a deeper understanding of what that signifies. That pouring of water in baptism, mystical sense is incorporation into Christ and incorporation into Christ's body of the church. And that sharing of bread and wine is not, you know, a human uh, nourishment. It's a spiritual nourishment. It's receiving Christ in the sacrament. But that can only be seen on the deeper level, the mystical level. And then they begin to talk about mystical contemplation, which is the hidden contemplation of, of God. And by the, around, they begin to talk about mystical union, this is around the fourth century. You begin to find some of the Christian authors, think of the Macarius, one of the great desert fathers, one of the earliest who talks about having a mystical union with Christ. By about the year 500, a mysterious author called Dionysius talks about mystical theology. Mystical theology. And if you read the Dionysian writings, they're very, very difficult, but very important. You'll find mystical theology is not a classroom exercise. It's nothing to do. It's the description of the theology that governs a Christian community, it's a monastic community actually, probably somewhere in Syria. And it's a description of their prayer life, their reading of the scriptures, their meditation and contemplation of what the meaning of monasticism is as bringing them into deeper contact with God. That's mystical theology. And indeed, that's the sense that it keeps. Teresa of Avila, early on in her life, which, you, which some of you have read, you know, she talks about having visions and experiences of God. She says, I understand they call this mystical theology. She's not talking about anything she read or was taught in a in classroom. She's talking about the experience that God has sent her as, uh, as a mystical uh, theology. So the term is, is ancient. And it's used in a wide variety of contexts to indicate that depth dimension that I think is still what's so significant when we use the term mysticism itself. You won't find in the tradition many people talking about mystics. They talk about contemplatives. They talk about contemplatives. Those who practice mystical theology are contemplatives, for the most part, down until about the early 17th century, when the, ter the traditional term contemplative begins to transfer over into the term mystics. For instance, it's not in Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, but the immediate generation of Carmelites after Teresa and John begin to speak of Teresa and John as mystics. So at the same time that they, uh, the noun mysticism is coming in, those people who are called contemplatives begin to be called mystics. So there is, a, there is a kind of transition here. But my point is that our modern vocabulary about mysticism and mystics is not, although it's created in a relatively modern period, it's rooted almost as far back as you can go in the tradition. Now that term, 
uh, mysticism and mystics comes into Christianity with a whole range of other important terms that are vital to the history of the Christian uh, mystical tradition. Let me just mention a, a few of these. Uh, the term contemplation itself, theoria in Greek, you won't find it in the Christian scriptures. But at the same time that the term mysticism was coming in, certain thinkers began to say, well, theoria, contemplatio, speculatio, that speaks to something that is very important to us. And what does it speak to? The term theory was a Greek term. It had been taken over by the philosophers to indicate the careful attention that the philosophers directed to the ultimate principle, the good, the one, beauty, etc. The real, the object of study of the philosopher and his exercise was an exercise of theoria of contemplatio. And many of the Greek philosophers also spoke about theoria theou, the contemplation of God. Clement of Alexandria and his contemporaries said, that sounds just like what we were told in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. One of the key scriptural texts, actually, in the whole Christian mystical tradition. And uh, for, for Clement, a way to understand that, a way to explain that, a, a way to deepen it, was to use that Greek philosophical terminology and all the richness, that uh, speculative richness that had, it had created to try to understand what it means when the, Jesus promises the, his, belief, his followers that they will see God if they attain purity of heart. They will attain theoria theu. Another key term is deification. Deification, theosis is the, is the Greek here. Again, it's a term that, as a, as a word, you're not going to find in the Christian scriptures. But the early Christians said, well, that really reflects a number of the things that are crucial to the whole Christian faith and the economy of the Incarnation. God became man so that man might become God. Irenaeus. Of one of the second century fathers and a martyr was the first to use that phrase, God became man so that man might become God. And almost all the later fathers of both East and West follow him in using that. You can find it in Athanasius, you can find it in Augustine, you can find it in everybody else. That the whole purpose of the incarnation was that we might become divine. And there are certain texts in the scriptures that seem to say that in a more uh, particular sense. Let me just quote one, Second Peter, 1.4 says of God, Thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises, so that you may escape the corruption that is in the world and may become participants of the divine nature. You may become participants of the divine nature. Well, what else is that but deification? So again, de deification, uh, which some people say, oh, you know, that just belongs to Eastern Christianity, which is not true. You find it all over in the Western mystical tradition as well. Deification is, is an essential part of the Christian message and crucial, of course, to Christian uh, mystical history as well. So after a little bit of this history, we can ask, well, you know, what then do we mean by mysticism? And here we enter into the whole problem of definitions. 1899. A man, an English, uh, famous English scholar and clergyman, W.R. Ng, in his book, Christian Mysticism, says, no word in our language, not even socialism, has been employed more loosely than mysticism. <laughs> it's still true. <laughs> he actually gives 22 different definitions in this, uh, the appendix to Christian mysticism. My friend Louis Dupre, in the article he wrote on mysticism in the Encyclopedia of Religion in 1987, says, no definition could be both meaningful and sufficiently comprehensive to include all experiences that at some time or other have been described as mystical. So it's a word of art that's very difficult to give a concrete and single meaning to that everybody will agree upon. That's like the word religion itself. Departments of religion exist partly on the debate over what is religion. 
And you can find many, many definitions of what is religion, but they still talk about it. And they have a general sense of what they're talking about, even though they may disagree on which element is more important than other elements. Mysticism is like that. And so part of the study of mysticism is really you know, taking part in that, uh, in that debate and hopefully learning something and gradually working towards not exactly an exact definition. I don't think it's the kind of thing you could give an exact definition to, but a better understanding. So let me give you my understanding. I don't call, call it a, a definition. Um, I have this in my couple of my different writings, and I'll, I'll read it twice because it's a little complicated, then I'm going to unpack it. Mysticism is that part or element of Christian belief and practice that concerns the preparation for the consciousness of and the effect of what mystics themselves have described as a direct, immediate, and transformative presence of God. So let me try to take each of the important elements in that. I call it a heuristic description. That is, it's a kind of description that helps us to understand as we read mystical texts more and more. I don't say it's some final definition. First of all, as I said, following von Hugel, mysticism is a part or element of religion. It's not the whole of religion. And the healthy mystical element is only healthy if it recognizes that there is an institutional and an intellectual side of Christianity as well. And these three aspects are always integrative and interactive, frequently you know, with quarrels and differences of opinion and tensions and difficulties. But we have to commit ourselves to that work of integration. So it's a part or element. Secondly, th that description indicates that it's a process. It's preparation for consciousness of an effect. In other words, it's a life journey. It's not a moment of particular, say, union with God or whatever. Though that is integral and very, very important. And many philosophers who study mysticism think they study mysticism when they only study a few descriptions of the, the final experience, the acme experience of union with God or something else. I think that's a bad mistake. Because what we're studying is a process by which a person, the contemplative or the mystic, prepares for, over a long period of time, has some kind of experience or moment of consciousness that is transformative, and then goes out to live a life that uses that new experience, that new transformation, in order to affect change in themselves and change in other people. So mysticism has to be studied as a process as a life journey, as I put it, rather than as, you know, uh, uh, focusing in on this one kind of moment of consciousness or whatever. And secondly, as I said, mysticism for me describes the consciousness of this direct or immediate moment of God's presence in our lives. Why consciousness? Most students of mysticism talk about mystical experience. And it's true that the mystics do have experiences of the direct presence of God. But for a lot of us, when we hear the word experience, we think of feeling something or sensing something. And I think consciousness is a much larger term because mysticism is much more than just some kind of new feeling, some new kind of emotion, some new kind of sensation. It often includes that. But consciousness enables us to tie in the whole aspect of the intentionality of the subject, the whole inner life of a subject. In other words, consciousness is our sense of awareness that exists both in terms of our sensation, in terms of our thinking, in terms of our loving and deciding. These are all conscious acts. And to have a transformative moment of God's presence in our lives it's not only a matter, it may not even involve the new sensation or new feeling, but it certainly involves a new kind of thinking and a new kind of loving. So that's why I think the term consciousness, in a certain sense, is, is more expansive. Not to exclude experience, and mystics themselves use the term experience a good deal, but to emphasize that it's more than just a new feeling, something special. So I, wow, I felt something really I've never felt before. Well, what did you think about it? How did it affect your life? 
How did it lead you to new ways of understanding and, uh, and loving? And those are all conscious acts that are connected with and that flow from that uh, transformative uh, kind of moment. And so, mystical consciousness involves sensation, it involves thinking, it involves loving, it involves deciding, it involves acting, etc. And in that sense, you know, in our ordinary consciousness, we can say that we exist on two different kinds of levels. That is, we are con ordinary consciousness, we have an awareness, an awareness of objects, an awareness of people. But we also have an awareness of ourselves that may be implicit, but we can make it explicit by thinking, I'm the one who's actually, you know, having this kind of experience. The mystics claim that in a certain sense, we can have consciousness on three levels. Not only a consciousness of objects, perhaps, and a consciousness of ourselves, but a kind of co-presence of the divine, a co-presence of God. What Thomas Merton once called a meta-consciousness in one of his writings. And that that third level of God in us, in our prayer life, and even in our, our everyday activities, is most of the time you know, not present in our minds, but the mystical tradition insists that it can become present. It, become, it can become more powerful. It can, in a certain sense, even become uh, over, uh, overwhelming. Uh, so that that mystical consciousness is a three-level consciousness, in, in a sense, rather than just on the two levels. Sometimes implicit, sometimes more explicit. And of course, it's going to differ very, very much because it's on a continuum of activity. It's on a continuum of consciousness. And that's another very important point, because certainly there are the great mystics and the great contemplatives. Uh, people like uh, Teresa, a uh, Meister Eckhart, a uh, Bonaventure, Augustine or Origen in the, in the early church, and many other figures that, that we could point to. Uh, but the fact that these people had a much deeper sense of this divine co-presence or meta-consciousness doesn't mean that others can't share it. That everyone doesn't have a certain access to it. They just go further along the way. I mean, it's like, you know, playing a game. Lots of people play basketball, but only a few people are supreme basketball stars. It's like learning to play an instrument. Lots of people practice at an instrument, but the great, the really great players go and are playing in symphony orchestras. If we think of mysticism that way, that everybody is called to it, but we're called to it in terms of different ways, and the great players, <laughs> whether it be in a sport, or in music, or in art, are kinds of inspirations for the rest of us who are aspiring to that deeper kind of transformation. But it doesn't exclude us. We're on that continuum. They're just ahead. They're examples. And examples not so much from their own activities, they all say this, examples of divine grace. Uh, so that there's no two classes, <laughs> the elite mystics, mystics and the ordinary Christians. There's a continuum of mystical consciousness in every Christian, I believe, who's trying to live a deeper life. Uh, the other, uh, two other issues regarding that, uh, that uh, kind of description that I've given. One is, you know, can, can we have a direct or immediate experience of God in our lives? Well, you know, this involves a lot of different uh, issues that are too complicated to unpack here. Philosophical issues, theological issues, etc. But the mystics do insist that God becomes present to them in a more immediate fashion than in other kinds of activities. And it's that immediacy which may involve even a kind of direct consciousness of God that I think the mystics themselves, at least, uh, uh, testify to. They all insist, however, there's a great difference between what we could call immediate experience of God and the final experience of God in heaven. I mean, that's crucial to almost every Christian mystical author, that. Uh, um, whatever consciousness they can enjoy in this life is a kind of foretaste at best for what's the final goal of contemplation in the, in the, in the Visio Dei. And then I want to say just a little bit about the notion of transformation. Mystical consciousness as transformative. Uh, 
And here I've learned a lot in terms of uh, the many years that I've been writing this long history of mysticism because when I first worked out this kind of description, uh, I didn't really emphasize the notion of transformation as much. But the more I've read in the mystical tradition, the more that I see that uh, transform transformative aspect of the deeper consciousness of God is absolutely crucial. It changes people. And it changes people in a way that improves them and that improves those uh, around them. And it involves a transformation that's both affective and intellectual. The two major powers of the human thinking subject, of course, the human intentional subject, are the power to know and the power to love. And so this transformation takes place affectively, affectively, because it gives one a deeper sense of loving God and being loved by God. And it changes intellectually, it gives us a deeper sense of who God is. Not what God is. Nobody knows what God is. Thomas Aquinas and everybody insists on that. No one can know what God is. Uh, so the mystic doesn't learn more about God. What we know about God, we, some of it comes from our reason, most of it comes from our faith. The mystic doesn't learn new facts about God or more information about God. What the mystic gets is a better sense of the reality of God, a more immediate, intuitive, some call it, or connatural sense about uh, God, knowing God in a new way not more stuff about God, because we can't really know more stuff about God. And it includes that positive sense of knowing God more directly, but the mystics insist it also includes the negative sense, the deeper and deeper realization of what we can never know what God is. Understanding that God cannot be understood. We all say that's true, but do we really know it? The great mystics, Think of a Meister Eckhart as a perfect example of this and says that the deeper you get into the mystery of God, the more you realize you cannot know what God is. And so there's a negative aspect and a positive aspect, I think, to the, to the intellectual uh, side of this. And of course, it's also the presence of God. We talked about the presence of God. And yet, if you begin to read the tradition, you'll see that a lot of the mystics talk about God's absence. God is not here. God is either absent or sometimes God seems to be punishing those who love him the most. So that there's always a complex interplay between presence and absence when we talk about consciousness of God. I have a quotation here. I actually have two quotations. First one is from Simon Weil, great French philosopher and mystic of the 20th century. Many of you, of course, have read her. And uh, I think, I hope you've profited from her the way that I have. She once said, this is in one, one of her notebooks, contact with human creatures has given us through a sense of presence. Contact with God has given us through a sense of absence. Compared with this absence, presence becomes more absent than absence. <laughs> <laughs> My second quotation comes from John Maine. Uh, my favorite of John Maine's book, uh, books is, that I've read, I haven't read them all, is The Way of Unknowing. And um, he has a wonderful short chapter here on God's two silences. Again, many of you are more familiar with this than, than I am, the two silences. The silence of revelation and the silence of absence. And let me just read you uh, uh, half a paragraph here. One of the things we learn through meditation as we mature, as we go further along the path, is to be equally content with either of these forms of silence, with the infinite sense of his presence as with the finite sense of his absence. It is harder for us at the beginning because when we start to meditate, we haven't learned much about detachment. We haven't reached the stage where we can be equally content with absence as with presence. And anyway, we're always looking for our meditation to satisfy us. We're always, um, we're always looking to prove to ourselves that it works, that now we know God. Now we've learned to live in his presence. But the purpose of the second form of silence, his absence, is to purify us so that we learn to love God selflessly 
as he loves us and as he loves himself. So that that interplay between the presence and, and the absence is, is crucial to uh, the, the mystical tradition. And when I use that term presence of God, I mean, I, in the, my little description there, it could be presence slash absence because it always involves God. Similar to that is a, a slight meditation on the meaning of language, language about God particularly the language that we read in the mystical authors. And of course, there's a paradox here, because all mystics insist that God is utterly ineffable and cannot be spoken about, but they sure say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they go on and on. They feel compelled to speak about that which one cannot speak, because that is what they're called to, because they're called to be inviting inviting, making an invitation to others to try to reach that kind of consciousness which will change, change people, but then remains so difficult to talk about. So that um, the study of mysticism is really a study of the language that the mystics have left us. Because we have no direct access to the consciousness of any past figure, or even the consciousness of people uh, today. What we have is the record that they leave to us in their words and in, uh, and in their teachings. And of course, God is not an object, so we can't use objective language in talking uh, about uh, God. We have to use a language that's stretched and transformed and turned upside down, and um, a language that's more like poetry than it is like a description, an objective description in any scientific kinds of fashion. And so when we read the mystics, I think we have to be conscious of that. It can still be deeply theological language, and it can have a, a you know, coherence and a precision, but it's not an objective language. We can't talk about God as an object because God isn't an object. And so the mystics use what I call verbal strategies for speaking about God, and strategies that as you read mystical authors, you can become more and more accustomed to. Um, they speak about God through images that suggest rather than exhaust. For example, um, in the 13th century and on, they begin talking about, mystics begin talking about God as the abyss. God as the abyss. And so there's a whole range of uh, abyssal language, as I like to uh, call it, in, in the tradition. Or one of the traditional images used about the absolute in infinite unknowability of God is God is described as an infinite ocean in which the soul can swim like a, uh, you know, swim like a fish. Or like the vast expanse of the air in which the soul uh, you know, flies around like, like a bird. The whole mystical tradition is filled with these powerful kinds of images because there's sometimes images can suggest things that more prosaic language uh, cannot. Mystics also use a variety of metaphors. They use paradoxes. They use oxymoronic, oxymoronic expressions. They use rhetorical excess. Um, you know, think of uh, the whole uh, issue of uh, the brilliant darkness of God. The brilliant darkness of God that the Dionysian tradition talks about. You know, how can you have a brilliant darkness? But putting two ideas that don't go together in the world of common experience makes a suggestion to us about the world of that uncommon, that uncommon world of a deeper consciousness. So when one reads and one studies the mystic, you, ha you have to be ready to kind of uh, go with that kind of language and try to see, well, you know, what, what it's doing. Mystical language also is always both positive and negative. It describes God in positive terms. God is good, God is kind, God is benevolent, God is a great shining light, etc. The Greeks call this cataphatic language, positive languages. But the mystics always insist that we can't talk about God, so negative language is better than positive language. But we need both, negative language or apophatic uh, language. You'll find these terms, by the way, of course, in Christian uh, history, they really start with the Dionysian writings and Dennis Dionysius' mystical theology. Then they get used in different ways by almost all mystics in the tradition. 
And no mystic is either all positive or all negative, all cataphatic or all apophatic. You can't be. All mystics use and combine positive language with negative language in a whole variety of ways. And most mystics insist there's a third level, <laughs> a level that goes beyond both affirmation and negation, because God is ultimately beyond all our affirmations and all our negations. And again, Dionysius is very good on this, but many later mystics also experiment with this. So I like to say we have cataphatic language, the positive, apophatic language, which is seen as more correct and negative, and then you have hyperphatic language. Hyperphatic language. You go beyond yes and no. You go into a kind of realm where you're testing the limits of human expressibility. And certain mystics do that. Again, Meister Eckhart would be a very good, uh, a very good example of that. Certainly, some mystics are much more positive in what they tell us, but no mystic lacks a negative dimension, an apophatic dimension. Other mystics uh, like uh, Eckhart and Nicholas of Cusa and others stress the apophatic, but in the long, at the end of the day, they all say, God is beyond both our affirmations and our negations. God is, is hyperphatic. Finally, what, one of the things that this uh, tells us is that, you know, to, to use the tradition, the great mystical tradition, now almost 2,000 years old, means to recognize that we're part of a, what I like to call a textual community. A textual community. These mystical texts were written down to help other people, sometimes within small religious groups, sometimes within larger communities, to help them along the way along that path to transformation. And uh, so the, uh, these mystical communities and the textual communities ex exist today. And in a certain way, they're, they're even strengthened today. We have more of the riches of the Christian mystical tradition available today to readers than we've probably had ever before. And uh, this, I think, has been one of the real triumphs of the last uh, generation or so in making that that material available for reading, for studying, for teaching, and for one's own personal uh, uh, appropriation. Uh, the main thing, of course, is, is to recognize that we stand within that tradition. There are little stories throughout history. If you read almost any of the, uh, of the, the great mystics, they'll tell you the books that influenced them so much. Again, I use the example of Teresa of Avila in her life, uh, chapter eight. You know, Teresa was a kind of indifferent nun. She really wasn't much of a nun at all. She tried to practice interior prayer, but she wasn't getting anywhere for 20 years. She says she didn't get anywhere. And then Grace changed her, but part of that change came through uh, seeing a statue of the bleeding Christ during Lent and meditating on it. Part of it came from reading St. Augustine's Confessions, she tells us in chapter eight. She said she read the Confessions. It had been just translated into Spanish, actually. And when she came to the place uh, in Augustine's Confessions where he describes his conversion, suddenly she felt as if the saint were talking directly to her. And she opened her heart and grace, in a certain sense, poured in. But she got that through the inspiration, uh, the median, if you will, the instrumentality of reading about Augustine's conversion in the Confessions. So mystical books do have effects. Another little story to uh, illustrate that before I spend some time at, at, at opening it up for questions. Uh, there's a uh, mystical Beguine, a free-form religious woman uh, in uh, Austria, in Vienna, <coughs> Margaret Van Becken. You probably ne never heard of her, but th we have a, a life of her by her friar confessor, a Franciscan. And he tells the story about uh, she could probably read the office, but she couldn't really, was not fully literate. So he and she would read Bernard of Clairvaux's sermons on the Song of Songs together. And uh, she would ask him questions about what is Bernard saying and what, is he, you know, what does he mean here? And he would explain Bernard's deep mystical teaching to her as they read the uh, confessions together. These things happened throughout the whole history of the tradition. Well, what's nice about these little vignettes through the, what Teresa tells us about herself and what uh, Blan Becken's uh, confessor tells us is you, you get a sense of how these texts have been used by people 
and I've influenced people and have been instruments, I would say, of, uh, of grace in terms of the pursuit of a deeper awareness of God's presence in our lives. I could say lots, lots more about the nature of uh, mysticism, but I've given you a kind of overview of, of the way in which I approach it, and I'd be very happy to um, take questions or some, make some observations or comments or whatever.